Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing a potential resolution to one of the mysteries of exoplanets, the beautiful planets found outside of the solar system, with many planets discovered in the last decade or so, providing quite a lot of mysteries and quite a lot of unexplained observations that even today the scientists are having trouble with. But as you might already know, many of these observations and the majority of these discoveries came from the iconic Kepler telescope. The telescope that orbited the Sun and that observed a very specific part of the night skies, in the process discovering tiny shadows of tiny planets passing in front of distant stars. This was the main location for the Kepler field of view, and if you were to try to imagine what this would look like compared to the rest of the galaxy, here's roughly what this cone looks like, with this tiny region in the Milky Way representing the region where we've discovered nearly 10,000 different exoplanets but still being a relatively small part of volume of the entire galaxy. Nevertheless, after nearly a decade, and specifically starting in 2014, we actually suddenly got a huge boost of new discoveries, and as you can see as of today, over 5,000 have already been confirmed, and nearly 10,000 are believed to exist out there. But as of today, one of the major mysteries and discoveries is really in regards to the types of planets that the scientists keep finding. So obviously larger planets or more massive planets are going to be more easily visible and so they do form the larger number here. As a matter of fact when it comes to planets similar to Mars and similar to Earth, these terrestrial planets are somewhat rare. But they have been found before, it just the bigger planets and the more massive ones are so much easier to find. But as more and more planets were discovered, something unusual started to occur in the overall data. First of all, the initial discoveries showed us that most of the exoplanets out there are extremely different from anything we have in the solar system. In other words, not only do planets like Earth might not even exist that often, the majority of the planets out there seem to be also different from planets like Jupiter, planets like Neptune, and planets like Mars and Venus. For example, a lot of the planets found are known as hot Jupiters. Planets that are usually a little bit more massive than Jupiter, but often much larger in size, and often containing extremely hot atmospheres with the atmospheres then producing a lot of unusual effects, and even, as we've mentioned in some of the previous videos, sometimes raining things like metals and rocks. For example, one of the planets we've discussed even seems to have titanium rain. But many of these planets also inflate to dramatic sizes, creating what's known as poofy planets. But more intriguing discoveries and mysteries came from smaller planets, planets that we're kind of more interested in. Here, instead of discovering a lot of terrestrial planets, the scientists kept finding two that seem to be the most populous in the galaxy. We have something the scientists refer to as mini-Neptunes, or basically planets that are slightly smaller and less massive than Neptune, maybe resembling something like this. And these potentially represent some of the most populous planets discovered so far. And then the other type being super-Earths, a planet that's slightly larger and potentially more massive than planet Earth, but significantly smaller than Neptune. In this case, this would be maybe two to three masses of planet Earth, and anywhere from 50 to 80% larger in terms of size. And even early on, quite a lot of these super-Earths and mini-Neptunes were found around a lot of the systems observed by Kepler. And naturally, this was kind of unusual and somewhat unexpected. But I guess what's more unexpected and what's even more unusual is the gap between them. Over the years, the scientists realized that in between mini-Neptunes and super-Earths, there was actually a kind of a gap that seemed to make no sense. As a matter of fact, this phenomenon became known as the small planet radius gap. And so even though statistically we expect this to be a more kind of an even distribution, for some reason when it came to certain sizes, these planets did not seem to exist as much, or sometimes even at all. In terms of the actual size, it would be a planet that's roughly around 1.6 to 1.7 times the size of planet Earth, or literally right between a mini-Neptune and a super-Earth. So what exactly is happening right here? Now because these are the most common planets discovered in the galaxy, a lot of scientists became intrigued by this and wanted to actually figure out what's happening here. But in order to learn all of this, the scientists had to first figure out what these planets are most likely like and what they actually have in their atmospheres. For example, for a typical super-Earth like this one right here, Corit 7b, it's believed that, well, they have to be a little bit more massive than planet Earth, but definitely larger in size, at least 60% larger in volume. And it's even been suggested that if planet 9 exists, it could be one of these mysterious planets, which would also explain the mystery of why we don't have these planets in the solar system. We might have one, but it's just hiding. 
but in terms of what happens on the surface, these are probably still some of the more mysterious planets out there. Some of them could possess solid surface and very thick atmosphere, some of them could even have maybe Earth-like conditions, but because we don't really have anything to compare them to in the solar system, it's currently unknown to us. Nevertheless, they're believed to be mostly terrestrial, with potentially some atmosphere on the surface. Not a lot, but some. But as a contrast, here is maybe what a typical mini Neptune looks like. It kind of does resemble a Neptune, and that's because it's mostly made of gas. It might have a similar hydrogen and helium atmosphere, it might also have a relatively deep layer of ice, and potentially possess water and ammonia similar to Neptune. But it could also have some kind of a rocky surface underneath all of this. In general though, its atmosphere is believed to be much thinner than the one around Neptune-like planets. And so if it actually did not have all of this atmosphere, it would potentially resemble some kind of an ocean planet instead. Intriguingly enough, here in the solar system, when we consider planets like Neptune and Uranus, Uranus is a bit of an oddball. As a matter of fact, some scientists have previously suggested that Uranus might be actually a combination of two mini-Neptunes, which collided a long time ago, which is also why it's sort of on the side. And would also explain where all of our mini-Neptunes are. They basically turn into an actual Neptune, or Uranus in this case. But just a hypothesis, not really a theory. But because of the abundance of these two types of planets in the galaxy, it's kind of been suggested that, well, maybe the gap exists because at some point one of them sort of becomes the other. And I guess more specifically, sometimes the mini Neptunes might turn into super Earths. And very likely because they end up losing a huge amount of their primordial atmosphere, with the mass loss eventually turning a mini Neptune into what we refer to as a super Earth, which is a lot more stable with some scientists suggesting that there's some kind of a barrier or potentially some kind of a trigger that causes certain mini Neptunes to start this mass loss. But I guess the question is, why? What could happen to them in order to start this? Well, today it's believed there are two possible pathways. One of them is referred to as the core-powered mass loss. It's actually a result of the internal heat resulting from the planetary formation. In this case, it's believed that the heat from the planet itself could actually start stripping the atmosphere from within causing a gas planet to evaporate, turning into a super-Earth. But this was never proven, never seen anywhere. The other explanation is a little bit more obvious. The star. This is what's known as photoevaporation. In this case, intense X-rays or ultraviolet radiation coming from the star, with time can simply transform the planet from one type to the other. Both scenarios made sense, but which one is correct? Actually, they could be both correct, but which one can we prove definitively? Looks like... It's the latter, the second scenario. This new paper that you can find in the description below definitively discovered that some mini Neptunes seem to actually lose their atmospheres by leaking a lot of helium and potentially hydrogen, and thus eventually losing their mass. In this case, the scientists took a look at four young or relatively young mini Neptunes orbiting K type stars, also known as orange dwarfs, all of them relatively recently discovered, and all of them being between 2.1 and 2.8 radii of planet Earth. And by using specific spectroscopy techniques to identify what's happening around these stars, they learned that all four planets had significant helium outflows with the actual amount equivalent to predicted amounts from photoevaporation. And in this case, the amount was high enough that in just a few hundred million years, these planets can entirely lose pretty much all of their atmosphere. And because these are young planets, it does explain how some of these many Neptunes turn into super-Earths over time, in under a billion years. And since in this case the star itself wasn't even that powerful, it means that more powerful stars can do so more effectively. And so at least one mystery out there have officially been solved. But obviously this doesn't answer all of the questions. For example, it doesn't answer the question of whether planets can lose atmospheres in other ways. Or, I guess more importantly, if this has also happened around the solar system. Have the planets in the solar system also lost their atmospheres using a similar principle when the sun was extremely young? I mean, right now there's no suggestion that any of the terrestrial planets used to be similar to some of the super-Earths or mini-Neptunes, but this idea still raises these questions, specifically because the planets in the solar system are just so different from anything else we see in the galaxy. For example, there are very few planets similar to Saturn that have been discovered so far, and definitely not a lot of systems out there that have both Neptune and Uranus-like planets orbiting at very specific distances. And that's of course some of the future questions we'll probably be investigating in future videos, 
because unfortunately for now nobody knows if anything like this happened here. But I guess this paper by itself is still very important, especially because it does confirm the idea and the hypothesis scientists had for a pretty long time. But because we still have so many other missions going on, such as the TASS mission, and even the upcoming Chinese missions we've discussed in the video right there or in the description below, it means that a lot more of these mysteries are hopefully going to be solved in the next few years. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the one full person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.